name is Brett, and I am the lead pastor here at New Life Church, and I want to welcome you here if you are new this morning. It is an exciting day to be here. So grateful for these guys to be able to join us. Can we give them another round of applause? Man. And Cindy, who puts in a ton of time and energy and effort on both sides. to create something that we get to be a part of on Sunday morning, which I get excited to come every Sunday. I know I say this over and over and over again, but this week, even more so, I am just pumped to be here. Hopefully you guys had a good week. How many people had a good week this week? All right. We had a number of good weeks out there. You know, probably not as good as my brother Grant, though, which if you didn't notice this morning, he's not here, which you might not have noticed because his team is awesome and doesn't need him. And if you're watching online, Grant, <laughs> Because he's doing this instead. Take a look at this picture. Yeah. I know. God, rough life, man. So he is currently in Wisconsin in the Madison area with some friends. And he got that yesterday and was flying high. So his week was good. But then his buddy got one too, which was a half an inch longer. <laughs> And as a brother, that was fun to just be like, <laughs> too bad, buddy. <laughs> so they're doing that again today. But as he shared, as he has told many of you, and he said from the stage, that it's an awesome opportunity for him to get out with individuals, to connect, to have fellowship, right? A really churchy word. But to be with individuals, and I'm guaranteeing that they are praying and they are worshiping and they are thinking of us today and they are having a great week. Or maybe you had a week kind of like mine. My week was one of these where there were some amazing moments. And then there were other things that happened this week that if they never happened again in my life, I would be totally okay with that. <laughs> You ever had that where you're just like, oh, God, yeah, you know, I, I know I'm going to learn something through this, or I did learn something through it, but if I don't have to learn that lesson again, that would be fantastic. But one of the things that has helped me in those moments is in this last year, like just being here as a part of New Life Church and being with you guys, the thoughtfulness and the love from this church has just been absolutely incredible. And that was something we experienced quite a bit this week. And then last week, I had an opportunity to talk to a couple. I had mentioned a couple weeks ago that God's just breaking my heart, right? He's challenging me. He's pushing me. And I've got to own it. And I need to understand that when I get up here, and if for some reason emotion comes out, as I call it passion, if passion comes out because I'm drinking too much water and it's coming out of my eyes, <laughs> I just need to own it. And so I had a lovely couple in the church give me one of these. And said, here you go, take this with you when you're on stage so you can own it. And I said, awesome, I will do that. So if you see me carrying this, it's because I'm trying to figure that out. You know, this week we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And I don't have a moment this week that I feel like I'm going to need that. But you never know how God's going to move because the Spirit is at work. And the Spirit is challenging us and pushing us and moving us forward. And I know that the Spirit is at work in my life. But as I say that, for many of us, it's kind of like, what does that mean, right? As we've been talking through this series, we're discussing our doctrinal statement as a church, why we believe what we believe. And we're in week five of this, and we started with the Bible as the foundation, that we can know God, and we can know it through his word that he has given us. And we've been studying this in a systematic way. If you know what systematic theology is, it's a structured form of theology, a structured form of understanding God. And so we believe that the foundation of that is the Bible, and that through the Bible we can know God, and we've been studying who he is, studying him within the Trinity to begin with, and then within each persons of the Trinity, God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and today the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's one of those concepts that if we would be honest as we walk in today, if you've been in church for a while, or maybe you've never been in church today, and what I'm saying to you is brand new, there's a little bit of an element of it that you're just kind of like, huh? I don't know if I fully understand this. I don't know if I grasp it completely because it's hard to define, right? As we talk about the Holy Spirit, it's easy to define God the Father because I have a father or I know somebody that has a father or I've seen an example of what a father is or what a father isn't. I can conceptually, I can understand the idea of father. I can understand the idea of creator as we talked about God as the originator. I know what that looks like. 
I can understand the concept of Jesus because he came. He was here on earth. There is a lot of material about who he was. But when it comes to the spirit, it's hard to define what that means. In fact, for many years, the understanding of the spirit was also called the Holy Ghost. Not confusing at all, right? <laughs> In fact, I grew up with that terminology, the Holy Ghost. And I tell you, as a little kid, it was scary. <laughs> I don't want him in me. <laughs> the Holy Ghost lives in you. Ah! But if you look at the history of why it was translated as the Holy Ghost, the King James Version did that initially because in the 1600s, when it was translated, ghost was the closest thing that they could come up with that meant immaterial being. Because that's what the Holy Spirit is, an immaterial being. In fact, if you think of the concept of giving up the ghost, right? Your spirit leaves you. It was as close as they could get to immaterial being, spirit within you. But as all language, it's fluid. And so it transitions and it changes. And so the meaning of ghost has taken on different things today. So when we say Holy Ghost, it can be extremely confusing because when they originally translated King James Version, they didn't know who Casper was. And now we have that concept. So when you think of the Holy Ghost, you think of this little bubble that's white that's floating around that, how do I interact with that? What does that look like? And so the understanding of ghost has changed. So now it's the Holy Spirit. Well, to be honest, our English language is really poor at trying to describe the concept of what the Holy Spirit is. He is an immaterial being, and yet he's personal and relational. And so there is a concept to him that isn't just this fluid nature of, is it vapor? Is it mist? No, it's not. It's solid. It's tangible. It's something that I can hold on to because the terminology and language that's used in the Bible is personal. It's not neutral. It's actually masculine. So when speaking of the Holy Spirit, it is masculine terminology to a person. An individual that we can know, that we can understand, that we can have a relationship with, a member of the Trinity. So today, I'm going to use two words to define a little bit the Holy Spirit. Maybe we can't define necessarily who it is and what that looks like, but we can very clearly through Scripture define the what. What is the Holy Spirit? What is his job? What are his functions? And so the two words I'm going to use primarily today, and this doesn't encompass everything, but this will be used for the definition we're going to be going after, is glorify and serve. What is the role of the Holy Spirit in our world today? To glorify and serve. To glorify God the Father and the Son and to serve them. How does he do that? Well, God's plan, enacted, empowered by Jesus, brought to fruition, lived out by the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit then looks back to the Father and the Son to live out that plan on earth today with us, right here, right now, in this moment. Yet, when we say glorify and serve, it can be very easy to lower the Spirit to a level less than God the Father and the Son. And we've got to be very careful not to do that. Because the Bible very clearly says that the Spirit is equal with God the Father, equal with the Son, but different in his role. And so we're going to look at those two things today. With the, the framework of glorify and serve, we are going to look at who the Holy Spirit is within the Trinity, equal to God, and then what he does, and then why that matters to us, why we believe that. So I'm going to start this morning with our statement of faith, and I'm going to begin with what it says the Holy Spirit, or what we believe the Holy Spirit to be. Our statement of faith says this, we believe in the Holy Spirit who came forth from the Father and the Son to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and to regenerate, sanctify, and empower all who believe in Jesus Christ. We believe that the Holy Spirit indwells every believer in Christ and that he is an abiding helper, teacher, and guide. And then you see a number of verses there that correspond to our statement of faith. So as a church, we believe that the Holy Spirit is one with God the Father and the Son and believe that the Bible speaks very clearly to this. Paul, when speaking to the working of the gifts that have been given to us, speaks in threefold in a Trinitarian language in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6, when he says this, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. 
The Bible over and over and over again uses the Spirit and the Son and the Father in the same language, in the same sentences, in co-equalness with each other, just like Paul does here in 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, 1 Peter 1, 2, Jude 20 through 21. Correlate the Spirit in equality with God the Father. One of the most powerful examples of this is seen in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 5, which by the way, if you don't have a Bible this morning, I'd love to give you one. They're on the back there, and I have a really cool story. So we bought 250 250 of these Bibles at the beginning of the year with the intention to give them all out. And I made a challenge that we'd love to give them out by the end of the year. Guess what? We got to make another order. We had a chance this past week, the academy was doing a number of things. They made care bags for people as they were going to different places within the city that they could give out. And they slid 120 Bibles into those care packages and took them this week into St. Paul and Minneapolis and other areas to give them out and tell people that Jesus loves them no matter where they're at. So we're going to have to make another order. So I hope that that order then will disappear by the end of the year. And so if you guys have needs for these, let me know. We can get you some. We'd love to give them out as much as possible. If you need one, they're on the back table. Grab one. If you don't like the hard copy, go ahead and download it on your app. And then you can follow along with us in the Bible app. Again, today I'm going to go through a lot of scripture, not near as much as I have been the last couple of weeks, but all that information is available in the Bible app. Save it today as an event so you can look back at it in the, last couple, or in the next couple of weeks. But like I said, one of the most powerful examples of God being equal, or the Spirit being equal to God, is seen in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, where it says this. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not just lied to human beings, but you have lied to God. Peter very clearly says that you have lied to the Holy Spirit, and in doing so, you have not only lied to men, but you have lied to God. Why did Satan put this in your heart that you would lie to God when you were lying to the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit and God are seen as one. Peter believes this. David then in Psalms tells us the same thing, that God is everywhere, that we cannot hide from him, and says this in Psalm 139, 1 through 8. You have searched me, O Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my, li- all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Again, David says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? There was no difference between the two. The presence of God was everywhere. And David is saying, if I go here, if I do this, if I rise, if I fall, wherever it is that I go, your spirit is there. Where can I go to flee from you? We see equality with God and the spirit very clearly spoken of as one entity. You cannot escape one or the other. Again, then in 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 16, it says this, the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. A person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. A person with the Spirit makes judgment about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments, for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. I want to dig into this passage a little bit because there is a lot here. First thing I want to point out is the Spirit and God, again, are seen as equal, okay? The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? Equality. 
God and the Spirit are one. Who can know your own thoughts except your own spirit, right? If I were to tell you that my spirit inside me knows me, you would think of equality. You would say, yeah, totally. Your spirit can understand you. If there's multiple parts to who we are, if we're spiritual beings and if we're humans, right, that have a fleshly body, but we have something else, this tent that we live in, there's another aspect of us. You'd sit there going, it makes sense that your spirit is within you, which is exactly what this says. For who knows thoughts except for their own spirit? No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Equality. And yet, in the very next verse, there's individuality. For we have received, for what we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. So there's this equality where there's this oneness. We see the Spirit of God, that this essence that they're together, and yet he sends his Spirit out. And again, the terminology here is not of something that's just neutral. It's a person that he sends his Spirit out, his very own Spirit he gives to us. And what we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that you may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The Spirit, then, is the one that was empowering the disciples to write what it is that they were writing on behalf of God, because God and the Spirit were one, three in one. And many of you might be sitting here going, huh, that doesn't make sense at all. In fact, it doesn't make sense. In fact, Paul says that in the very next line. Unless we have the Spirit, unless we know who Christ is, unless we have his Spirit within us, who's also the Spirit of God, because they're one, they can't be separated. Unless we know these things, we would consider it foolishness. As I was sitting here this week studying this, I was wrestling through, how do you explain this concept? And I'm thankful because I was with a group of individuals yesterday that clearly made it known to me how you could explain this. This is understandable if you know everything behind it to get to this point. If you don't know everything behind it to get to this point, it is foolishness, it's foolishness if the Spirit is not giving it to you. Here's how I'm going to explain it. It's a lot like math. <laughs> okay? How many people here think math is foolishness? Yes. I've told you this before, and I will probably take this to my grave. I am terrible at math. And so I was talking to a group yesterday that was describing a class in college that had to be taken. And they were talking about weird, weird, just strange phrases like derivatives and all sorts of other stuff, which was just gibberish, right? And talked about this professor that got up in front of the class and wrote a problem in, I don't know, calculus or something, one of those really strong classes you have to be really smart for, wrote the problem, and all of a sudden 20 hands went up because there were 20 people in the room that had no idea what he was talking about. Can you explain that to us? And he says, if you don't know this, I'm not going backwards, I'm only going forwards. 20 people dropped the class the very next day. Because he wasn't willing to get them to that point to understand what he was talking about. And so to them, it was gibberish. They had no idea what he was saying. I talked to many math people, and there are many math people in this room right now that love math. And yet I think they're crazy. <laughs> There's one of them. <laughs> And yet, it's true, right? Would we argue that that class, what that professor was teaching as he was moving forward, wasn't true? Just because I didn't understand it doesn't mean it's not true. And so like math, for me, you've got to know the information behind it to get to the point where then you can make the assumption that everything moving forward is not true. So if my daughter, and she does this English thing where she has to come up with synonyms for all these big words, if foolishness were ever a word, I'd tell her a synonym is math. <laughs> Who would be wrong? I would. <laughs> That's exactly right. I would be wrong, right? Because even though I don't fully understand the concept that goes forward, if I took the time to sit down and learn and dig into it and figure it out, I could someday maybe <laughs> take that class. Because there were individuals in that class that understood what that person was talking about and they didn't have to drop the class. And so the same thing holds true with this is that these are concepts that we really have to think through. How can there be oneness and equality and yet differing individuals within the same person? There are things that I don't fully understand. And what I need to say is, okay, God, in these moments, I need the Spirit. I need your help to figure this out. Because the moving forward doesn't necessarily mean it's untrue if I don't understand it. It just means that I don't get it. 
And every single one of us as human beings would not understand this unless the Spirit was able to give it to us, which then I'm excited to tell you that the Spirit that does give it to us is one with God. And that as we wrestle through these things, we can understand them and we will see them to be true. And we will know that when Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that the Spirit knows everything and that we can know what the Spirit knows and the Spirit is one with God, that when we have the Spirit, what do we have? The mind of Christ. That we have the mind of Christ. That we can know the things that God knows through who Jesus was on this earth by the power of the Spirit, that we can have the same mind. And that we can then make judgments, not just human judgments, but spiritual judgments for who has, the, who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him. The Holy Spirit does. And when we have Jesus, we have the Spirit, so we have the mind of Christ. It can be complicated. It can be hard. But if we wrestle with it, if we really dig into it, if we try to understand it, we will realize that it is true. That it is not gibberish, that it is not foolishness, that it actually has relevancy in our world today. Just like math. I don't know how it's relevant. I don't know people that use it at any point. And yet somehow it's still true. It just doesn't make sense. This can be very similar. It may sound like gibberish. But when we understand that God is one, that there are three in one, that each one of them are equal to God that we can understand who God is, that we can know God personally, that we can have a relationship with him, and that he will indwell us and it will make sense. That the world all of a sudden will be seen in a way you've never seen it before. And that's part of the role of the Holy Spirit, is to help us do that, is to help us see life in a way we've never seen it before. So I want to read John 16, 8 through 15. What is the unique role of the Spirit? Well, Jesus very clearly tells us in John 16, he says this, when he comes again, a person, an individual that you can have a relationship with, when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the price, prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will only speak what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the spirit you will receive from me will the spirit, I said, the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. This is an incredible passage because Jesus is speaking specifically his disciples. And he's talking to them about what's about to come. And that he's leaving. And everything that he needs to tell them, he will not be able to tell them while he's here on this earth. So he's going to send them a helper. And what's awesome is we can look back and see this actually come true. Because once Jesus left, the Spirit came. It's called Pentecost. We know the moment. We've read about it. We've experienced it maybe in our own lives. If we know who Jesus Christ is, our personal Lord and Savior, the Spirit indwells us, which we'll get to here in a minute. And then he spoke to his disciples after Christ left and gave them the rest of the New Testament. And gave them the words, the exact thing that Jesus said. He will come and he will guide you into truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. We see that. We have the books. They're right here. In fact, we see what the Spirit said to Paul. We see what the Spirit said to Peter. We see what the Spirit said to the author of Hebrews. We see what the Spirit said to John. And John wrote this awesome book called Revelation. And what's cool is, Jesus says, while I'm here, you need to focus on me. And you can't hear what it is I have to tell you. But when I leave, someone will come to tell you what is yet to come. And he did. And we have it. And we can stand on it as truth. And yet, we can also take this promise that the Spirit then will speak to us the same way that he spoke to his disciples. Not giving them anything new, but giving us insight into what it is that Jesus gave to his disciples and what the Spirit gave to his disciples that he then gave to us. The Spirit gives us that ability because we then have the mind of Christ. He convicts us of sin. He guides us into truth. He glorifies Christ through all of it. What is one of the major ways that the Spirit does that then? By giving us new life. It's in the name of our church. 
fact, it's our mission, helping people find new life in Christ. Where does that come from? This is one of the most crucial roles that the Spirit has, is that for us to understand who God is, for the Spirit to live within us, He must give us new life. John 6, 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Jesus speaking about the Spirit and the power that he would have. Romans, Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free. In Galatians 6, 8. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. That we have the promise that on behalf of God, through what Jesus did, that the Spirit gives us new life. That we are different, that we can be changed, that we can have the mind of Christ. And then once we have the mind of Christ, once we understand that who Jesus is, the Spirit then indwells us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Which again, I love. As I've been studying this, as I've been reading the Bible more through this whole process, I can't get away from the Trinity and how each one of them plays their own unique role and that they're all combined right here in this verse is the same. You, your body is a holy temple. For who? The Holy Spirit. Whom you receive from God but at a price by Jesus Christ. All three of them are there. All three of them are in the process. And we can know who they are. We can be a part of what God is doing as we understand who we are more in him as we grow closer to him. Romans 8, 9 through 11 then says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Whoo! We have hope that we can be changed through the Spirit of God. The Spirit then lives itself out within us by giving us gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. Now to each one of the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. Excuse me. To another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. Or to another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. And then it goes on as the Spirit continues to give us gifts. All of us then show that the Spirit is extremely powerful. But as we talk about the responsibility is that the Spirit glorifies and serves God, we have to understand that there is power. That the Holy Spirit is just as powerful as God the Father and the Son to live out the plan that God has here within the three on earth. And we have to revere that. We have to worship that. We have to understand that because there's so much more about the Spirit. He was at creation. He empowered the prophets to speak on behalf of God. It says up here, he raised Jesus from the dead. He convicts us of sin. He gives us new life. And is ultimately the one that we receive power from here on earth. The Spirit is absolutely incredible. And so my hope is today that as we know this information a little bit more, as maybe we're trying to wrap our minds around it a little bit more, that we walk out today a little bit more in awe of who the Spirit is and raise him to his rightful place. Because why is the Spirit important? And that's what we're getting to right now. Why do we believe this? Why is this important? First and foremost, the Spirit is the power of life transformation. And that is the major hope that we have within the gospel. There's only one force that can change lives. There's only one thing that can renew us, and that is God through his spirit working in our lives, which is something that I am reminded of over and over and over again, and so thankful for that I am a man who is being changed. Am I a man that is completely changed? No, I'm not. And I will be the first to admit that. And I had a great reminder of that this week. I was with my wife on Monday. We were having a great day. And then, you know, you have one of those great days together that ends up not being such a great day. Anybody ever had that before? Maybe I'm the only one. But, you know, a conversation came up around some things that were super important. And, you know, we had a very passionate discussion around these super important items. And, you know, through 
gritted teeth or smiling at each other and loving each other like every spouse and other spouse usually does. You know, you get to the end of the night then and you lay down and you're like, are we good? You're good? I'm good? Okay, I'm good. The worst part of it then is Tuesday morning I was supposed to be part of the Woodbury prayer breakfast because this week was the national day of prayer. And I'm having this awesome conversation with my wife Monday night. And Tuesday morning, I'm supposed to wake up and be super spiritual and pray for all the churches in Woodbury at the prayer breakfast. <laughs> at about 11 o'clock at night, I was tempted to call the coordinator and just be like, you know what, I can't make it. I can't do it. And yet what was cool is God reminded me, hey, you're not there yet, but I'm changing you. That you are being transformed, that you are not perfect and never will be, and yet you are being moved in a direction that I have for you, and my spirit lives within you. The cool part of the prayer breakfast is I got to pray for all the churches in Woodbury, including all the pastors, all the leaders, all the volunteers, and you know who I was praying for? <laughs> Me. <laughs> God, give them strength. Give them the ability to not be morons. I, mean, I didn't say that, but that's exactly what I was feeling. That God, I am not there yet, and the hope that I have in this world is that you have promised life transformation. And that when I make those mistakes, that I can come back from them, that it is not the end because you are continuing to renew me. And so as we experience that new life, that's why our hope and our mission here as a church is to help other people find that. Because we live in a world that so desperately needs it. And if we can be examples of it, not that we're going to be perfect all the time, that we can understand where we're at, we can understand our faults, that we can continue to move forward, that we can rely on the Spirit to do that, we then can be an example for that. Because here's the reality of life. We were never meant to do it alone. We were never meant to do it alone. We were meant to be in perfect relationship with God, and then we got in the way of ourselves. And God wants to bring that back. And who's helping in that process? The spirit that lives within us to bring us this way first and then this way second. And so our four priorities start with the idea of pursuing God first because that's where it begins. As we pursue God, as he pursues us, as we're closer in relationship with him, we can understand what the Spirit is doing in our lives, that he's changing us. And through these moments, we can continue to grow. And hopefully through it, help others. I can get up here and say, hey, you know what? If you get in a fight with your wife, say I'm sorry. Because fortunately for me, I have a wife that still loves me. Right? You still love me? Okay, good. <laughs> the crazy part of it is it probably won't be the last time. Don't you just hate that? Man, we walk away from those situations like, why do we do this? This is so dumb. Let's never do it again, right? And then we shake hands on it. We're never going to do it again. And then we go and do it again. Because we need God to help us do that. Change us. And then we need people around us. Connect. Pursue, connect, serve, reach. We need people around us that can hold us accountable right? That we can be challenged by as our lives are being changed. Second then, why is this important in our lives? Today specifically, I think this is important more than it's ever been before because the Spirit then defines our experiences as we are transformed. As we are wrestling through these things, as we are asking the questions why they are happening, we need to rely on the Spirit to lead us into truth. John 16, 13, but when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. As scripture and our statement tell us, the Spirit is our helper, our teacher, our guide. And we need this today probably more than ever because we live in a very experiential world. We put a lot of trust and a lot of faith in our experiences. And here's the cool thing about the Holy Spirit and the thing we also have to be careful with. The Holy Spirit is very experiential. The Holy Spirit is with us in the moment, leading us and teaching us into things that we have may never experienced before. And so we have to be careful with that because we have to interpret our experiences through the lens of the Holy Spirit instead of doing it the other way around. Experiences aren't bad. In fact, I want to experience God in my life more than I ever have before. If I've studied theology, my prayer has been, God, help me to understand your sovereignty that you are in charge, that you are who you say you are, that you have everything in your hands and know that it is all up to you, but I want to see you do crazy things. I want to experience things that I have never experienced before that point people back to you, which is what the Spirit does, so I can experience you in ways that I never have before. You know, it's easy in our life today to think that the moments where we get goosebumps, the moments where we just have that feeling, is God. Sometimes it's not. 
Sometimes it's just an emotion. And sometimes it leads us away from God. And so we have to define our experiences by God and who he is rather than what we feel or what we're experiencing in our own humanity. I had a professor a number of years ago talk about the carefulness of this nature and making sure that we're doing the right thing when he said, if you're reading scripture and you see something nobody has ever seen before, or you experience something and you hear something about Jesus or about the Spirit about God that you've never heard before, make this assumption, you're wrong. (laughs) Because if the Spirit doesn't point us back to who God is and there's something there that we've never seen before, there's a good chance it's not who God is. And we run that risk in our world today because we are viewing God through our experiences rather than viewing our experiences through God. It's a slight shift, but it's happening widespread in our world today. We are viewing God through our experiences and not viewing our experiences through God. What do I mean by this? I believe that we, we experience what we believe, okay? Let me break it down just a little bit. We experience what we believe. We need to know what we believe because in our world today, when we go through experiences, we take our belief system and pose them on those experiences. Point in case to the disciples. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on water, what did they think it was? It was a ghost. Why? Because they didn't believe that somebody could walk on water. So they immediately said, it's a ghost, because they didn't have a conceptual construct where they could say that it was actually a man walking on water. Each and every single one of us has been through experiences in our lives that have crafted belief systems that when we go through something, we then impose our beliefs on that experience, and then what do we do? Then we view God through that experience. And we sit there going, God, you can't be fair, you can't be just, you can't be this because of all this stuff over here that I've experienced. Instead, we need to take a look at that experience through God's lens, through Scripture, and say, God, you actually need to teach me what this experience is. What do I need to know about this? And in many cases, we need to redefine our experiences. We live in a world that has put a lot on God that actually doesn't belong there because we've experienced things through our lens of what we believe that needs to be redefined. I sit with many people over and over and over again that come in and they say, God is this because of this. Well, what does the Bible say God is? And then how does that define what you experienced? The Spirit will lead us back to this. He will lead us back to truth. He will lead us to who God is. This was closed. And I'm making a very bold statement with that. As we live in an experiential world today, it would be very easy to take that passage that I just spoke about him leading us into truth and showing us new things to believe that all of that actually has to do with us. And I'm going to make the statement that it doesn't. I believe that Jesus was speaking to his disciples about what the Spirit would do for them through the rest of how they were writing this. And then when John says, if anybody adds or takes away from this, he means it because the Spirit gave it to him. And so when we experience the things in our lives, we need to define them through this because this is what God has given us. This is his word. So what does this say about our lives and what we're going through? And you want to know why I'm even more passionate about that today? Because many people want to throw this out the window. And you want, to know why, you want to know why they want to throw it out the window? Because it's true. And it makes us uncomfortable. And the experiences that I have, I want to define them the way that I want to define them. I don't want somebody else defining them for me. You know why I hate math? It makes me uncomfortable. So I don't do it. Doesn't mean it's not true. Just because this makes us uncomfortable and forces us to redefine our experiences doesn't mean it's not true. And so we gotta be very careful with that in our world today because what the Bible tells us is that the Spirit is to glorify God and to serve God. So when he speaks, where is it gonna point back to? To God. Even if that makes us uncomfortable. Even if that makes us sit there going, Based off of how I feel and what I've experienced, I'm not sure I like that. We had an opportunity yesterday as elders. We gather on the first Saturday of the month and we pray. We talk about things that are going on. We talk about relationships and we talk about all sorts of other things. It's a time to bond. And we studied Psalm 51 yesterday. We're in this series of psalms. And so each one of the elders has picked their favorite psalm. And we're going to read through one psalm a month for the next year. 
and each elder is going to lead us through that. And yesterday was Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a beautiful psalm, and it is really, really hard. It is a very tough psalm because Psalm 51 is a psalm that David wrote after Bathsheba, or the incident with Bathsheba. And after this child that was conceived through this indiscretion died. And so as we're reading Psalm 51, there were a lot of things that came up. God, why would that happen? God, why did you do that? God, that doesn't seem fair. God, I don't know if I like that. And yet what's awesome is when you read the heart of David in that psalm and you read how he calls upon God and what he says about God, it redefines your experience. It redefines who you are and how you should view God. So my challenge, read that psalm this week. At some point, I'll teach on it. I love it. In fact, I read it. It's my pre-sermon psalm. I used to listen to songs before games when I played basketball. I now read psalms. I am definitely getting old. (laughs) But I get up there because one of the things it says is, God, when I understand who you are more, open my lips so that my mouth will declare your praise. The fact that David could say that after that incident, he had a right understanding of the situation that he was in, and yet it wasn't comfortable. And so do we have that? Do we have that understanding as we go through things? And guess who helps us do that? The Spirit does. The Spirit will define our experiences, and we need to know who God is so that we understand what it is that we're going through. Third, then, the Spirit will guide us in the will of the Father. Spirit will guide us in the will of the Father. We can know the will of God and truth because the Spirit will guide us in that direction. Spirit does not speak on his own. If you're hearing something, like I said, from the Spirit that doesn't align with what God has said already, then you must be very, very careful with it. Because everything the Spirit does glorifies the Father and the Son. So if that's a couple of the main roles that the Spirit has, the Spirit indwells us once we've received him, what do you think two of our main roles in this world should be? To glorify and to serve. So we're in your situation, you're asking a question, God, is this your will? Two things you can ask yourself is, does it glorify God and does it serve him? And if it glorifies God and it serves him and it point people, points people in that direction, go for it, 100%, run with it. And if it doesn't, you may need to redefine it. Number four then, God is with us in all we do. Why is this, the Spirit important? Because God is with us in all we do. Romans 8, 11, And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. One of the really cool things about Christianity and creepy things about Christianity is that verse right there. That we are indwelled by the Spirit. That the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead is living in you, that you have that kind of power. That because of God's love for us, Christ's death on the cross, and the work of the Spirit in this world today, that we can know who God is inside of us each and every day. When we open up this book, inspired by the Spirit, with the Spirit living within us, it truly changes your life. You will never, ever, 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 ever be the same. And then it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me, Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There is so much power in the understanding of who the Spirit is and how that lives itself out in you. So we can glorify God. That is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives within me. And that is the hope that I have in this world that I am not who I am, that through the Spirit I have been changed, and that God continues to do that. That every day I can wake up going, oh man, yesterday was a bad day, but you know what? Today's a new day. Great is your faithfulness. That God, you are there, and that living through me, changing me, that somehow, someway, I can be an instrument for you in the lives of others. And so this is my hope as we end today, that God will make us, mold us, shape us to be more like him as he lives in us and through us and out of us. That God will make us, mold us, and shape us to be more like him as he lives in us and through us and out of us. And it is the Spirit that does that. That by God, through Christ, through his death and resurrection, that the Spirit lives within me and is making and molding and shaping me every day 
so that I can go out in his name and live his, for his glory and serve him in all that I do. Whoo, that is good news. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are a holy, just, loving God that has come, that knows us, that is personal, that is relational. And even in all the